Good evening and welcome to Friday night at the Big Cat Cafe with Duncan Carling Rogers and Elizabeth Ellen Carter. Good evening, Elizabeth. Of course, your uh, uh, second published novel came yes. out last week. Yes, yes, yes. Very, very excited by that. Uh, the title of the novel is Warrior Surrender. Mm -hmm. It's been released by um, Etopia e Press. Etopia Press in the United States. Uh, currently available as, as an ebook and uh, going into print next year. Yes. Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the, the story told in the novel. Absolutely. Warrior Surrender is set in 1077, and that's 11 years after William the Conqueror um, invaded and obviously conquered England. Um, he didn't uh, just do that. Not uh, everyone was very happy about being conquered, particularly the Saxon earls of Northumbria. And um, I, I would have actually thought that not many people were happy about being conquered, but there you go. Well, there's a story, there's a story in that too. Um, but some very um, rebellious Saxon earls in Northumbria, uh, who'd been actually left in place by William, uh, rebelled and he went in brutally and that is known as the harrying of the north that took place in 1070. Now Northumbria of course is right on the Scottish border. It is, it is and this is where our um, story proper begins with our heroine Alfreya of Terswick um, coming back to her ancestral homelands having been in exile. Her father is dead, her brother is gravely injured, her only choice is to throw herself on the mercy of the Norman Baron who now rules her lands. Right, now this is a chap by the name of uh, Sebastian de la Croix. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, uh, he uh, is a man with a secret, isn't he? He is, and uh, the readers get to, to learn of this secret right at the beginning. And we see how, how an act of chivalry, an act of, of mercy, uh, is used by people with malevolent intent to, uh, to bring down a righteous man. Okay. So why does Frey surrender to Sebastian? Well, she has to. Her brother is gravely ill and the only chance to save his life is to forge a truce to get him to uh, St. Cuthbert's Abbey where he might be treated. Uh, and um, meanwhile, uh, we have a particularly villainous villain who's planning a return oh, at this time. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, Lord Drafen is a man with an agenda of his own. Um, he is handsome and charming and absolutely deadly dangerous. Uh, he, was, he was actually quite fun to write. Um, the villain in A Moonstone Obsession, Geoffrey, was a, uh, a rather tragic figure. Um, Drafen is just pure evil. Right, Moonstone Obsession, of course, being your first novel. But yes, that's right. Um, now, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the two lead characters in Warrior's Surrender. Oh, Alfreya is, is great. Um, she, she's brave and strong, but she really is at the end of her reserves. Um, she's been uh, forced into a life and into actions that, that really um, she's had to do out of necessity. Uh, Sebastian, on the other hand, is, um, is a really strong alpha hero. He is, but he's also a man of honor. Right, and of course, uh, Alfreya has been forced into the role of a, the leader of a battle force. That's that's right. Which, um, which is which is of course completely alien to what women would have been doing at that time. That's right. I mean, she's quite gifted with a uh, a long bow, a crossbow, and a and a knife. It's her sheer force of personality backed by her um, dearest manor arms, Larkwider, a really lovely character um, who keeps this band together um, even after the death of Alfreya's father. Now, you, you mentioned Larkwide. There are a range of, uh, of quite interesting secondary characters in Moria's Surrender. I'm thinking of uh, Orledge, who's, uh, who's quite interesting, um, and also um, uh, a, uh, a young man and a young woman who end up um, 
um, one deliberately and the other accidentally causing a lot of trouble <laughs> uh, for Alfreya. Freya. Yes, uh, uh, Baldwin, one of uh, Sebastian's knights and uh, Heloise Villiers, um, Sebastian's sister-in-law. Um, I guess worry surrender is all about choices and I've, I've only just thought of that. Um, you can, every action is, uh, is preceded by a, a deliberate choice. In the case of Baldwin, he makes the wrong choices and eventually pays. Um, our Freya makes the right choices even though it seemed to go against everything she's wanted and believed in. In some respects then, are we saying that it's a novel about the way the things that we think are right for us to do uh, are, are going to be the most advantageous for us to do uh, sometimes run actually counter to what is best for us? Uh, look, that is a part of it. Um, I, I love the exploration of human nature in, uh, in the novels that I write. So that is, that is a part of it. Uh, it's, it's also a look at um, real people in a time and space that might seem a bit alien to us. Uh, well, I, I've mentioned in a previous podcast, I believe, that uh, I had my doubts about romances set in medieval times. Mm. Uh, it, it, yeah. Love seems to be a particularly civilised uh, process, which, uh, which doesn't have a place in an uncivilised time. <laughs> but people are people throughout history, aren't they? They, they are. And, and that's, that goes without question. Uh, one of my other favorite supporting characters in Warrior's Surrender is Friar Dominic. Um, in some respects, I modeled him on Cadfael, the, uh, the great um, uh, Ellis Peters um, character, which was turned into a TV series in the, in the 90s. That was uh, starring Derek Jacobi, who we spoke about a few weeks we, ago as we well. We did in, in I, Claudius. Um, there's a, uh, a, a murder mystery in Warrior's Surrender there as well. That's quite a strong thread which actually runs through Warrior's Surrender, isn't it? Um, uh, it's something that you keep coming back to uh, uh, as the story of uh, Sebastian and Alfreya progresses. Uh, I do, and, and it's something that connects the two because... Um, from two very different perspectives, they're haunted by these murders. Right. Now, you're getting a bit of a reputation for doing fairly deep historical oh, research. The queen of research, I've been <laughs> called. I, I don't know I deserve the title, though. Okay. Um, but nonetheless, uh, okay, tell us, what were some of the things that you researched for Warrior's Surrender? Well, actually, I've just put a blog post up. Um, I, I was hosted by uh, Alison Stewart, another great historical writer. We're talking about water mills and, uh, and sluices, which, uh, which feature in uh, Warrior's Surrender. Um, I also featured there, uh, we were looking at uh, rush flooring. Uh, that, was, that was actually uh, quite interesting. Uh, Moton Bailey castles, the, uh, the um, form of flat pack um, castles that the Normans brought over. Um, what, did, they, did they bring them over from Ikea? <laughs> Not quite north of Scandinavia. I think the Vikings would have had problems with that. But um, a white castle that um, um, William the Conqueror built in London uh, was essentially brought over in pieces. It was a wooden structure. Um, right. brought across the uh, the channel. Right, okay, that, and I mean that's interesting because we think of castles and we think of them being all, all made out of stone. We don't think of uh, a large part of their construction being out of wood. Well, it's got to be because it allows you to very quickly um, set up a fort, which essentially is what they were. An, an immediate defence uh, yeah. in a hostile environment. Yeah. Um, Speaking of hostile environments, um, you also did some research on um, uh, longbow archery and broadsword battles. That was great fun. There was a great documentary that uh, National Ge Geographic did um, looking at um, the works of a particular uh, 15th century German fight master. And I just happened across this documentary at the early stages of researching Warrior's Surrender. And I learned interesting things like how a knight might defend himself against a better armed opponent. And right. that's, uh, that's using the, um, the hilt and the pommel uh, of his sword. Yeah, I remember you mentioning that um, 
Uh, this is the reason why a sword is often not sharp mm. near the handle. Uh, it has no edge near the handle and it's so you can turn it around and essentially use it like a hammer. Yeah, use it like a, uh, a hammer because if um, your opponent is wearing a, a helmet, um, at best you're going to give him a ringing headache, <laughs> at worst you're going to give him a compound skull fracture. Um, also using your sword as a, uh, a dagger too for short sharp thrusts. Right, okay, so it's not necessarily something that's, uh, that's done at arm's length. Uh, okay then, what's um, what's next? Oh, look, not much at all. <laughs> I'm currently writing a short story, part of the uh, the Moonstone universe called Moonstone Promise. Uh, for anyone who's read Moonstone Obsession, you'll fall in love with a lovely secondary character by the name of Toby Jackson. He gets his own happily ever after back in the United States, where he's from. Speaking of short stories, um, you have another short story actually being published shortly, don't you? Yes, on the 28th of November. Uh, my short story is called Three Ships. It's part of the short story anthology, A Season to Remember, with Eva Scott, Noel Clark, and Suzanne Bellamy. It has a Christmas and a sea theme. And, and that, that's that been great fun to write. Okay, and um, uh, of course, uh, the sequel uh, the full-length sequel to uh, Moonstone Obsession is uh, currently uh, being edited. It is. And um, then next year, which isn't too far away at all, um, you actually begin the writing work on um, your fourth novel. Yes, it is. Um, set in 3rd century AD Rome. Um, that's going to be a, um, a, a mix of, of romance and mystery as well. Okay. Well... That's another Friday night at the Big Cat Cafe. We hope you've uh, enjoyed hearing about Elizabeth's new novel. Uh, go get it. It's available online now. And uh, it's a good night from Duncan Carling Rogers. And it's good night from Elizabeth Ellen Carter. <laughs>